things that make him who he is and why he's like no other. Today we're in our 15th study in this series and we're talking about the God of grace. We're going to springboard from Ephesians chapter 1, but like every other one of these messages, we're going to see all, we're, we're going to see all sorts of scripture where God talks about his grace. We're reading just a few verses from Ephesians chapter 1. And I'd like you, we're going to read verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. And I particularly would like you to notice the doxology that we find in verses 6 and 7. So Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. And without blame before him in love, having predestinated Unto, uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of, his, of sins according to the riches of, of his grace. I'd like you to mark that word, grace, this morning. I think there is no other word perhaps in the English language that describes the mind of God and discloses his thoughts toward us better than this particular word, grace. There's a lot of words that we use to describe God and his, his workings toward us, but grace, that, that trumps a lot of things. It's a wonderful word. You know what I like about the word grace? Grace. It even sounds beautiful. I like the word grace. Songwriter after songwriter after songwriter writes about grace. There are a lot of things that we believe in, doc, uh, the doctrine of justification and redemption and sanctification. Those words don't find their way into very many songs, but grace does. It's, it's a melodious word. In fact, I... I was reading about this man named Philip Doddridge. Whenever I read about these old preachers, he, he was born in 1702. He died in 1751. Whenever I read about these guys, I feel like, man, what in the world am I doing? He wrote, he, not only was he a Congregationalist pastor in London for years, but he wrote over 400 hymns. And most of those hymns he wrote as conclusions to his sermons. That guy, man has more talent in his little finger than I got in my whole body. One of the hymns that he wrote to conclude a sermon, the hymn was called tis, uh, Grace Tis a Charming Sound, and these are the first two stanzas. Grace tis a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven echoes shall resound, and all the earth shall hear. Saved by his grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for all mankind. Jesus died for me. Grace is a charming sound. You know, you and I, you and I are the benefactors of a grace that we really don't understand and probably don't take full advantage of. We've tried different ways to define it. You've heard that little acrostic, God's riches at Christ's expense uh, to, for that or God's unmerited favor. That means we don't work for it or, or we, don't, uh, we don't earn it. Simply put, grace is God taking responsibility for our situation. Grace is God taking, account, or taking responsibility for our situation. What sets this attribute apart from all his other attributes? And I... I don't mean to demean it at all, but I, I, rather, I rather focus on this. What sets it apart from all the other attributes is that this attribute is voluntary. Exercising grace lies within the sovereignty of God's will. God has never been obligated to lavish his grace upon us, but he does. He does so out of his free will. His grace is amazing because he chose to offer it to us. Grace is always exercised in a downward direction. Squire Parsons wrote a song years ago 
and part of the song says, when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. That's the only way grace could move, is from God to us. We have talked about God's justice in the past. We know that Romans 6 verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death, and God in his holiness demands justice for our, our sin. He demands death as a righteous payment for it. But grace is the attribute by which God intervenes in that plan for justice. And he, he stays his hand of wrath. And he offers grace and mercy to people who don't deserve either. And that's, that's me and you. You know mercy and grace. Mercy is God withholding what is our right. Grace is God giving us what is not our right. The God of grace is going to be our, our focus today. It's difficult to grab, especially in the concept of salvation, it's difficult for us to grasp that concept of grace um, because our pride makes us want to do something. I don't want to fully rely on God for my salvation. I want to part in on this, so I want to do something. I want to be baptized, or I want to join the church, or I want to, I want to help people, and that's how I'm going to get to heaven. God's, God's going to look at my good works. They're going to outweigh my bad and and that's just not how grace works. So I, I'd like to look at three aspects today briefly, as briefly as we can when we're talking about grace. Three aspects of grace, and they are past, present, and future. God's work of grace in you and I in the past. God's work of grace in you and I right now. And God's future work of grace in us. This thing called grace that only God could give. You know, you and I would never have designed a plan of salvation like God did. I'm confident we would not have. I told, a, I told a, a group I was talking to Thursday night, I preached a funeral for one of our city workers that died Thursday evening. <coughs> Excuse me, I knew a few of them. I didn't know most of them there, but I knew a few of them. And I was talking to them about the grace of God and the need for them to be saved before it was their day, before it was their funeral. And I said, you know, I said, only God would come up with a plan like he did with salvation to save people from their sin. And I said, I, I know you folks here. And I said, I'm sorry that you're grieving like you are. I said, but I only have one son. I'm telling you, I would not give my son for you. How, how could we conceive a plan by which people could be saved where we offered our son for someone who hated us? I would never have done that. I still wouldn't do it. I wouldn't give my son up for that. But God did. The depth of grace, you and I are just, I don't even know if eternity is enough time for you and I to plumb that depth. It's, it's amazing grace. Every time we sing amazing grace, let it be amazing to you. Let's look at this today, past, present, and future grace. Start with that first one, past grace. Now, when we, when we went through the book of Ephesians, we took our time too. 54 sermons in the book of Ephesians. Your Bible still probably opens there by habit. Uh, we noted early on in the book that Paul's focus was salvation by grace. He started right here in verse 4. Starts talking about our salvation. And by verse 6, he's already mentioning grace and the riches of that grace. Salvation starts with grace because salvation starts with God. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10 refers to God like this. He is the God of all grace. Salvation is of God and through his grace, grace alone. And we have, a hard time, um, we have a hard time grasping that grace maybe because we don't have, or I shouldn't say we, I'm assuming you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today. So hopefully you've grasped these things. But I think the, world, the reason the world struggles with grace is because there are some foundational truths that have to be accepted in order for us to access the grace of God. The first, the first foundational truth is this, the moral state of man. We have to come to terms with the moral state of man. <coughs> Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3 is not a very flattering verse to you and me. Romans chapter 3 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. They've all gone out of the way, it goes on to say. By the time you get down to verse number 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And one of the reasons that people struggle with accessing grace is because 
they don't want to admit that, that they've sinned. You remember the, you remember the series we went through uh, with, uh, oh, Ray, what's his name? A little short Australian guy. Remember what? Ray Comfort. Remember that series we went through with Ray Comfort? And he'd go out and he'd ask people if they were sinners. And nobody wanted to fess up to that. You and I don't like to fess up to that until the Holy Spirit says, oh, yes, you are, Mark. There is none righteous. They have all gone out of the way. For all have sinned. We have to come to grips with the moral state of man. We want to do something because we are good people. And the scripture says that just isn't so. People have a hard time with the concept of grace because they have a hard time admitting the moral state of man. They also have a hard time, number two, with the true wages of sin. With the wages of of sin. You know, there's, a, there's a, a tendency in our world that the concept of justice and the concept of punishing wrongdoing is vanishing in our world. The way it's vanishing is people are beginning to call what's wrong right. And so now, now that works. We've dropped the necessity for punishment of transgression. There are, there are district attorneys all over our country that are now refusing to prosecute crimes that are still on the books. We don't want to deal with the wages of sin. You see it in homes. I, I wrote this down. We see it in homes in which disciplining children is too often ignored. Moms and dads, especially those of you who have young kids, chasten your children the Bible says in Proverbs that you should chasten them, discipline them. The King James word is betimes. I don't use that word hardly at all. It means chasten them early in their life, chasten them when they're young. If you would discipline and train your children when they're young, you would be surprised how few spankings or disciplines they're going to get when they're 8, 10, and 12 years old. But if you decide to start disciplining your children when they're 8, 10, and 12, you are in for a long life when it comes to those teenage years, a long life. Teach them early that it's not about their will. It's about God's will. Chasing them early. We, we don't recognize true wages of sin. So, Pastor, that, that seems kind of rough to be talking about chasing children. Here's why. Children that are raised thinking that can, they can behave or respond any way they want to without consequence become adults who are not at all drawn to a God who punishes evil doing. I say that again. Amen. Children are, who are raised thinking they can behave or respond any way they want without consequence become adults who are not at all drawn to a God that punishes evil doing or sin. But the Bible's clear. God is going to punish the lawbreaker. My goodness. He talks about in Genesis 2 and Ezekiel 18 and Romans 5 and Romans 6. He says he'll chase and sin with death. There's a phrase in, in Isaiah chapter 3, 11, and you, you can look this up. It says that the wicked, it's talking about the wicked man. And it says this, it shall be ill with him. That's a nice way of saying the way of the transgressor is hard. There are consequences to sin. But one of the reasons we don't grasp grace like we should is because not only do we push aside the, more, the true moral state of man, we don't want to deal with the true wages of sin. God's chastening hand. But James tells us this. Look it up, James 1.15. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. There's consequences to it. The true wages of sin. People struggle with salvation by grace because they don't understand the moral state of man, because they don't understand the true wages of sin, and finally, because they don't understand the spiritual helplessness of man. Spiritual helplessness. I, man, you know, people are able to do about anything today. Technology, social media... And artificial intelligence, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you right now, AI just scares me to death. Amen. Now, I, I know it has its advantages. We're taking some advantage, we, we take some advantage of here. But AI scares me to death. I, I think I told you, I was driving down the road with a preacher friend of mine. He said, Mark, what are you preaching on Sunday? This was when we were in our series in Revelation, and I told him. And he got on some little website, and in less than 10 minutes, he had a sermon that is biblically sound, based on the King James Bible, complete with illustrations, and included a children's church lesson that goes along with that, and I wouldn't have to study anything at all. 
Yet scripture says I am to study to show myself approved unto God. It's not pushing keystrokes on a, on a keypad. But you know what? Honestly, between the technology we have today and now AI coming into things, mankind thinks we can do just about anything, and we think we can get to know God on our own terms, and we, we can define how we're going to come to him. But scripture draws a pretty clear Scripture draws a pretty clear line here and say, saying this, nobody mends their relationship with God on their own doing and on their own terms. John chapter, look at John chapter 1, would you? John chapter 1, and we're, we're going to look at verses 12 and 13. And these may be very familiar scripture verses to you. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, But as many as received him... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The only way that I'm saved is of the will of God. The only way that I'm saved is if he gives me power. Jesus said, nobody's coming to me except the Father draw him. Which scares me when I hear people rejecting Christ because I think, is there a time out there when God is going to quit drawing them? And if he does, they can't be saved. The spiritual helplessness of man. John chapter 6, verse number 65. What does that verse say? Jesus is speaking, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. There's that verse. When you go over back, uh, back in the book of Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse number 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. What can that dead person do? Nothing. Nothing. You walk into a scene and you see somebody dead and you're like, get up. Get up. Tie your shoes. Pick up this book. What can they do? Nothing. Why? Because they're dead. I was dead in trespasses and sins, the spiritual helplessness of mankind. Augustus Toplady wrote a bunch of good, he's a good hymn writer. He wrote that famous hymn that you know, Rock of Ages. Remember that hymn? Verse 2 starts out like this. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Verse 3 starts out like this. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. What is that demonstrating? The spiritual helplessness of man. If God doesn't save me, if God doesn't save you, you'll never be saved. He is the Savior. God can't just, uh, let me say this. God just can't forgive sin like wipe it away and be done with it. Does that shock you I just said that? I'm not done, so don't, don't storm out of here. God can't just wipe away sin without that sin being paid for. He just can't dismiss it. Um, even, when you, even when you go to a store and they'll say, well, we'll just knock that off. We'll just knock that price off. You go to a car dealership. I told you before, I hate buying cars. I just hate it. No matter how good a deal I get, I always feel like I got hosed in that trade. I just, I hate it. But you go to a car dealership and they'll say, well, we'll just knock that off. That money just didn't go away. Somebody is not getting money. Somebody lost that. They, they just lost that. God just can't say, well, don't worry about your sins, Mark Campbell. Just don't worry. I'm just going to wipe those away. Nope. Those sins had to be paid for. Enter Jesus Christ and enter Jesus at Calvary, where he paid for our sins. This is a common theme throughout Paul's epistles Ephesians chapter 1, we're a little bit in Ephesians, but if you're there, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to what? According to the riches of his grace. You can't separate grace from Calvary. Grace is not available unless Calvary exists. You can't, you, you can't separate those, those two things. 
John chapter 1 and verse 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Where? In the cross of Jesus Christ. The grace came because the cross was there. You can't separate those two things. I, I think the greatest picture of our helplessness is that verse we read in Ephesians 2 uh, verse 5 and Ephesians 2 and verse 1 where it says we are dead in our sins. That is our helplessness. But thankfully, you also have Ephesians 2 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Dead in trespasses and sins, saved by grace. So we have this past grace. I hope you have that past grace, by the way. I hope somewhere in your life behind you, you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and this past grace, this saving grace is now yours. That you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. That's past grace. But then there's present grace. God's grace in you and his work of grace in me, it doesn't end when we get saved. The work of grace continues. In fact, James chapter 4 and verse 6 says this, But he giveth more grace to the believer. Not just saving grace, he giveth more grace. Now, it's not that God give more grace to save someone than he did this. It took the exact same amount of grace to save you as it did to save some criminal, some lifelong criminal in the deepest, darkest prison, serving the rest of his life in jail, it takes just as much grace to save you as it did him. Don't let that offend you. That's just the depth of our sin. But when it says he gives more grace, what is he saying? He's saying that when you need it, there's more grace available. When, when you have need of more grace in your life, Christian, there's more grace available. He giveth more grace. I heard that story of, uh, I heard that story of somebody, I think it went something like this, that they were standing at Niagara Falls and they were just amazed at how much water's coming over that fall. I've never been there. Um, but the water's just pouring over, you know, that edge. And, there's, and uh, there were two guys standing there looking at that. And he said, boy, that's a lot of water. And the guy standing with him says, there's more to come. You know, that's exactly how it is with the grace of God. It took a lot of grace to save me, but there's more to come. He giveth more grace. It's the present grace that you, have, you and I have. Now we're not talking about saving grace. Now we're talking about a grace that is, you might call it, sanctifying grace or strengthening grace. He gives more grace. Where does he do that? First of all, grace is sufficient in sanctifying you and me. We've been saved. Now he's going to sanctify us. He's going to make us more like Jesus than we are right now. Would you in your Bibles, are you still in Ephesians? Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 11. <clears throat> in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. The Bible says we are predestinated to this purpose. What is the purpose of God in every believer? It is to make them, to conform them to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's will in this is the same for you as it is me. His purpose here is to make us more like Christ, to conform us to the image of Jesus. He saves us, and then he starts working on us like a sculptor does a, a statue. He's got things to take away from me that do not look like Jesus. So he's conforming me to his image. It's great to know that grace not only saves me, but it, sanct it sanctifies me. It sustains me when I need it. Grace keeps us. You wake up every morning, and I wake up every morning, and, and we should be assured that our eternal destination is heaven has not been altered because of something we did yesterday. Did I sin yesterday? Yeah. Am I still going to heaven? Absolutely. Why? Because I'm kept. 
by this grace. He saved me and he keeps me by his grace. I hope you know that assurance. Not only do I hope that you are saved this morning, but I hope you have this deep assurance that God is continuing to work in you in circumstance, in relationship, uh, in his providence. God continues to work in you and work in me. This is his sanctifying grace. Now here's the truth. And if you want to confess it with me, you're welcome to. I don't always feel sanctified. There are times I just don't feel sanctified. But God is still working. His grace is still at work on me. Where sin, the Bible says, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. If you don't feel all that sanctified today, be assured God's grace is still working in you. Still working in me. If you don't feel I'm very sanctified today, just be assured God's still working on me. And when I don't feel you're being very sanctified, I'll think, well, God's still working on them too. It's God's, God's strengthening and sustaining and sanctifying grace. It's the grace that we have as believers that works with us through our day. When you encounter those things you're not expecting, Peter said that we are to grow in grace. He's not talking about saving grace. He's talking about this sanctifying grace. We are to grow in those things that make us more like Jesus and less like ourselves. Are you growing today? Are you growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? This is what God wants to do in you. It's the present work of grace. Our past work of grace, he saves us. But this present work, it's sufficient in sanctifying you. It's sufficient in making you more like Jesus. It's also sufficient for suffering. Grace is sufficient for suffering. I'm going to ask you to turn to a really familiar passage of Scripture. You and I probably have fled to it more times than we care to. Would you go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12? This is a, a, a confession by Paul. Paul, you, you get the idea here that Paul had a propensity maybe at times to struggle with pride. And here's a subtle confession of that. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 7 Paul says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In verse number seven, he's saying, God has given me a lot of revelation. I have been shown some fantastic things. And to keep me from thinking I'm all that, God gave me this thorn. Verse eight. For this thing, this thorn, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, and the power of, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God's grace is sufficient for suffering. The purpose of that thorn is to keep Paul from being lifted up in pride. It was to keep, him, to keep him humble. Paul said, I asked God three times to take this thorn away. Now, do you know what that thorn was? Because I don't. Now, there's a lot of suggestions out there. Some people said it's his physical infirmity. Some people believe it was a demon that just stayed with him all the time. Others believe it was a person that he had some type of relationship, and they were just, say it with me, they were a thorn in his side. You've had those people too. It very well could have been all those. Some people think it was his eyesight. This thorn, whatever it was, it afflicted him to keep him humble. And scripture says that, that Paul asked God, please take this away from me. Three times he prayed that prayer. Get this. God said the solution to, to Paul's suffering with this thorn was not removal. The solution to this suffering was not the removal of the source of the suffering. The solution is grace. God's grace is sufficient for your suffering. What does that suffering look like in you today? It could be tragic. The, the solution from God may not be removal of that suffering. It may be grace. That's a tough pill to swallow sometimes. The pill of grace, sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow. 
especially if you're the one suffering. But God said, I'm not going to remove it, Paul. I'm going to, I'm going to help you. This is what Paul says, or this is what God says to Paul in verse number nine. There's grace for you that's sufficient for this suffering, and I'm going to get you through it. So you have a burden today that maybe seems too great to bear. I don't know what that might be, but you have a burden too great to bear or something you didn't see coming. You would walk through it gladly with someone else. You just didn't expect to be walking through that suffering on your own. Let me say today, I'm not lessening, trust me, I am not lessening the greatness of your suffering. What I'm doing is lifting up and saying God's grace is greater than that. And if he chooses not to remove it, he will make a way of escape through his grace for you to bear a trial that you think is too much. His grace is just that good. God's word says he gives us exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. We had, Dr. Manley refers to uh, Life Action, the Life Action Revival we had here um, nearly 30 years ago probably. And one of the things that they said, they, they had all these little zingers that kind of stuck with you. Um, one of the things they said was based on Hebrews 4.16 where it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I don't remember which preacher said it, but one of those preachers said that verse means that you're going to get the grace you need just in the nick of time. Just when you need it. You don't need dying grace today because you're not dying. But when you are dying, you'll die with grace. God, God's making that available to you. Just in the nick of time, when, when labors are hard and, and burdens seem overwhelming, God's grace is sufficient for thee. Like, like he told Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. He could say that same thing to you or to me. God's grace is sufficient. Now, whether or not I'm going to appropriate that grace, that's a whole other thing. Annie Johnson Flint wrote a poem that was later set to music, and, and you might recognize this as a song, but it was originally written as a two-verse poem. The poem reads like this, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed before the day is half done, when we, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. That's the wonderful grace of God. Past grace that's what saves us. Present grace, that's what sustains and keeps us. It's making us more like Christ. And then there's future grace, that last thought. Future grace. Grace is going to bring your life and my life as a believer in Christ. It's going to bring it to its climax. It's going to bring it to its fruition. What is the promise of, of uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23? The wage of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life. When you go back to John chapter 10 and verse 28, Jesus is speaking. That's that passage of scripture where he talks about being the good shepherd. And it's a wonderful passage. But in verse number 28, he says this. Words are important in the Bible. He says this. I give them eternal life. He doesn't say... I will give them, future tense. He says, I give it to him right now. Did you know that right now you are a possessor of eternal life? It's not something that's going to be given to you when you die. You've got it right now. I give them eternal life. He gives us that life at, at salvation. We're saved and we're saved forever. You have possessed eternal life right now. Let me ask you a question. Considering the past grace of God that saved you and the present grace of God that is keeping and sustaining you and the future grace of God that will get you to glory, 
Are you relying on the grace of God in your day-to-day -day life? Are you living in that grace? Are you living out that grace? Are you demonstrating that? That it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's all of God. Are you living it out or are you striving to live the Christian life but in the power of the flesh? Because that's one of the most frustrating things you can do as a Christian. You know why? Because you can't do it and I can't do it. We can't live the Christian life in the power of the flesh. That is a cause of frustration for so many Christians. Instead of relying on the Spirit of God and the grace of God, they just think, well, I'm just going to do this. I am going to be nice if it kills me. <laughs> it's a spiritual thing. It's not something that I do in my own will. Jesus says it's God's grace that does that in us. It's the fruit of the Spirit that he's working up. Not that I practice. I don't practice the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is a resulting work of the Holy Spirit in me. Are you relying on it or are you striving to live the Christian life? There's a lot of Christians doing that. They're genuinely saved by grace. They're just trying to live the Christian life in the power of the flesh. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, may I give you this thought? Whenever we hear the word trying in relation to the Christian life, beware of that. Well, I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do that. I wouldn't try to do it. That's going to frustrate you. You can do it. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. When, you, when someone attaches that word trying in relation to living out the Christian life, let God do that. Live in the grace that God has given you for that day. This is, the, this is the trap. This trying trap. This is the trap that the Galatian believers fell into. In, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 1, Paul's talking to the Galatian believers. He says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold. I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If that's the way you're going to live, if you want to live out by doing, if you want to live the Christian life by doing these things, you've got to live out the whole law, not just circumstance. You've got to be perfect in every part of the law if that's what you're going to do. He's saying, that's a rough way to do that. Why don't you just stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free? And he's not calling you back to this yoke of bondage. Be not entangled, he says, with that yoke. That's what John Newton said in his hymn, Amazing Grace. His grace has brought us safe this far. Grace will lead us home. Started with grace. Finish with it. Walk in grace. Live in grace. The scene is David's palace. He's gathered his family around. David had a pretty big family. The Smiths have joined us today. They have five children. David had eight wives and 20 children, at least 20 children out of those eight wives. He's looking around his dining room uh, hall. He's the king of Israel, and I think there's a, uh, probably, probably a, a nice palace. He's defeated a lot of places, probably spoiled a lot of places. So he's sitting down for dinner, and, and they're waiting to begin dinner. And he's looking around. He's taking roll in his head, and he's looking around, and, and he's waiting for everybody to show up for dinner. That's quite a roll call. And all of a sudden, he's like, well, somebody's missing. Somebody's not here. And he hears clump, scrape, clump, scrape, clump, scrape, clump. Scrape. And in walks a crippled man from the hallway. And he walks right up to that table and sits down just like he's a member of David's family. His name is Mephibosheth, Jonathan's crippled son. And he's the perfect picture of grace. He's the enemy of the king. He's crippled and helpless. 
He has absolutely nothing to offer the king that would make David want to give him mercy, and yet David did. Is there any alive in Jonathan's family to whom I can show mercy? And for the rest of his life, that crippled man Mephibosheth ate with his crippled legs under the king's table. He ate there for the rest of his life. That's grace. You started with grace when he saved you. Finish with grace. It's brought you this far. Grace will leave you home. The Christian life can only be lived out by the grace of God. That's the only way this works. Not by strong will. Not by some mental decision where you and I flip a switch and we decide, well, we're just going to go this way. Not at all. Walk in the grace, walk in the grace of God. God's grace is able to break the great bondage, the greatest bondage known to any man. When nothing else can break that bondage, God's grace can do it. What I'm saying is that nothing we face in this life is greater than the grace of God. Now that's easy for me to say when nothing's going wrong. But when that wall is about to fall down on you or that wave is about to come over the top of you and knock you off your feet, remember this, nothing we face in this life is grace, greater than the grace of God. I have people come in, they'll sit in my office. And I, one of the things I love to say to them is God's grace is greater than this. His grace is greater than this. His grace is bigger than this. It is. I think one of the, one of the wonderful examples of this is a lady in the New Testament by the name of Lydia. We meet her, she's a business lady in the city of Thyatira, and I love the way that God describes her coming to Christ. It says in Acts 16 and verse 41, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, Paul preaching the gospel, heard us, and, and whose heart the Lord opened. I love that phrase, don't you? whose heart the Lord opened. No matter what else she was doing, God's grace was right there. It opened her heart. So to the doomed sinner, God's grace says, thy sins be forgiven thee. To the struggling Christian, God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. It's the grace of God. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily, I'm constrained to be. Let, my, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. My heart, my heart is prone to wander. Let thy goodness, let thy grace like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. The truth is this, church. All of us are in need of God's grace. Every person in here. If you're saved or if you're lost, you're in need of God's grace. You're in need of it for the sanctifying work that, that he wants to do every day, helping us live like, like we do. You're in need of it when you're struggling and when you're suffering. We're all in need of God's grace. And so my appeal this morning is to everyone. It's to the lost and to the saved. It's to those who are hopeless and those who are hurting. Drop, somebody said this. Drop your bucket of faith into the well of God's grace and you'll have plenty for whatever you need. The choir sings this song called Well of Grace. And the chorus says, I keep going back to the well of grace. That's the wonderful thing about it. He giveth more grace. And he's always able to do that. I don't know what your need of grace is this morning. Some of you might need to be saved or somebody hearing us online but they might need to accept Christ as Savior. I don't know that. That's between you and God. But I do know that every Christian needs grace and we need to be walking in it and appropriating it, not living in the power of the flesh. So I'd ask you to examine your life today. I'm not asking you, to, don't be thinking, well, you know, that person two rows in front of me, I'm glad they were here today because they needed that sermon. I needed that sermon today, and you needed that sermon today. In what area of your heart does God want to appropriate his grace? Do you know why Paul had that thorn? So he didn't get too proud. God's solution was grace. Some of you, maybe God needs to deal with that pride. 
Maybe that's why you have the thorn that you do, and God's saying removal's not the option here. It's not the solution. Grace is the solution. Every one of us need it. Let's surrender to his grace. Would you stand, please, with your heads bowed? Father, we thank you for being the God of grace this morning. Tender compassion, unfailing love. We've talked about so many things that you are toward us because of of who you are in yourself. And I thank you for saving us by your grace. Thank you for using that grace, that same grace, to keep us and to make us more like Christ. And you're, you've promised that that grace will lead us home, that one day we're going to be made just like our Savior. And there are people in this room, Lord, who have yet to come across that first step of grace. They've not been introduced to it yet because they don't know for sure that they're going to heaven when they die. There's a, there's a hope to. Nobody wants to go to hell. And Lord, if there's someone in here today hoping they go to heaven, I pray that they would come today and they'd find the grace of God that saves them. I pray, Lord, that any struggling Christians in here today would do what you invited us to do, and that's come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whatever your work of grace is in each of our hearts, May your Holy Spirit be pleased to use your word and do that in us. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Would you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment? I'd I'd like to give you an opportunity to come this morning and appropriate the grace of God. He is the God of grace. He doesn't demand anything else of you in order to be saved. And once you're saved, he says, why don't you live this life out in my power? What will you do? What what will you allow me to do in you? Church, what what work of grace does God want to do in your heart this morning? Your heart, not your neighbors, not uh, not your family. What does God want to do? What work of grace in your heart does God want to do this morning? Would you come and humble yourself before God? Ask him to do his work in you. Beg him to do his work in you. You come this morning as we wait. Amen. Thank you for your attention this morning. Aren't you thankful for God's grace? And I am. I am so thankful for his his grace uh, in me. Well, it's been good to be in the Lord's house today. I hope you've been encouraged this morning, and I hope you've maybe got fellowship with some brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, You sang well this morning. Can I just tell you? Uh, Go back to wonderful grace of Jesus. More of you men ought to be in choir than are. When we got down that chorus... There was more than just two or three guys singing wonderful, the matchless grace of Jesus. Some of you ought to be in choir. Shame on you for not using God's, God's gift and talent for his glory. Um, and then I'll say this too, and we're not, we're not converting. Don't worry, we're not getting away from the hymnal. You sang really well with a song you didn't know just because the lyrics were up there. I think you're worshiping the Lord, that you do that from the heart. We'll, we'll do that some more, but that song's going to become, that song's going to be a part of our are going forward, all right? Um, Learn that song. When you have opportunity and when we sing it, lift it up to the Lord. And um, I think if if anybody can sing out in this world, you've got reason to sing. If anybody else, rock and country and jazz and whoever else is out there, I don't even put rap in that genre. I don't even mention that. Those people are singing out there, they have no reason to sing like you and I have reason to sing. So when we sing, I don't care if you can sing good or bad, lift it up. 
let the Lord hear you, all right? God bless you, church. Brother Jeff's got a couple of announcements, and he's going to dismiss us in prayer. Thanks for being here today, and let's come back tonight. I'm, I'm so looking forward to hearing what God has done already in the Smiths family and then what God's leading them to do tonight, 6 o'clock, all right, 6 o'clock. Again, just remember to come back tonight to uh, to hear what uh, Brother Zach and Sarah have to say. We had them in our class this morning. They're just such a wonderful family, a nice young family. So I'm looking forward to being here tonight. I wish you'd come back and, and see what God has in store for us. Next Sunday night, it's going to be Sunday night at the Pavilion at 530. It's going to be a hot dog cookout. So uh, please sign up at the information table, and they'll give us a list of uh, how we need to prepare for that. So remember that next Sunday at 530. And first-time visitors, if you're here for the first time, Pastor and his wife would love to meet you out here in the vestibule. Uh, she has a little gift for you, so just remember that. If you're here for the first time, come back and meet with them. They'd love to meet you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. What a wonderful day to be in your house this morning, God, to be with your people. God, we just thank you for your word. God, how it touches our hearts. God, thank you for your, um, your grace on our lives. And Lord, we're so grateful that your mercies are supplied new every morning. God, I pray that you just help us to walk in that way. And God, when it comes down to the end of our way, Lord, we know that your perfect grace will carry us through. Lord, bless each and every one that's here today. I pray that you bring us back tonight. We're looking forward to hearing from the Smiths. And God, I pray your blessings upon them. We love you and thank you for it's all we, uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.